Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. I apologize if I went a little fast last week. So just throw something at me. No sugar? Okay. All right. We're going to be starting with uh, chapter 11. The handout you guys were given, uh, I changed the format a little to make it easier for you guys so you don't get lost. All right. Chapter 11. Chapter 11 opens with uh, John eating the strolls and giving a rod or a uh, reed, which is like a bamboo stick to measure. Uh, it was This rod or reed actually is grown in uh, the Jordan Valley, and it's measured the uh, temple to show God's uh, ownership. A reference to that would be Revelation 21, uh, 15. Verse 2, you have John measuring the whole city with this rod or reed. And uh, this is the temple that was rebuilt in the uh, tribulation. It was destroyed previously in 70 AD. However, we don't know if it's built before the uh, tribulation. It's kind of one of the mysteries. All right, there's a courtyard also mentioned where he's told not to measure uh, the courtyard because of the rejection they receive from the unbelieving Gentiles, those that were opposing his people. We go down to verse 3. That's uh, two witnesses. Uh, mentions 1,260 days or 42 months or three and a half uh, years, the second half of the seven years. All right, these two witnesses will bring a fire into a revival. They'll be like Billy Graham, but with the defense against them, trying to hurt them. They'll have breath like dragons. Verse 4, a drought happens with one of the disasters going on, the many uh, natural events. And uh, the world will hate uh, tribulation Christians for witnessing to people. Kind of reminds me of the Left Behind movies. Uh, I was watching one of them this week. Kind of went out of order, but they, they definitely were not the most popular people. Verse 9 through 11. The world is worshiping the Antichrist and the bodies of the two witnesses laying in the street. There's a beast that comes out of the bottomless pits. In verse 7, that kills the witnesses that they fought hard, but they lost. The world doesn't, hasn't learned to this point that they're still kind of sign, assigning their own fate, their own death warrants. They're, they're like that redhead stepchild. You can't, they won't understand that either turn towards God or you're going to die and uh, be eternally in hell. Two witnesses die uh, in, in verses 9 through 11, and they actually have a worldwide holiday where you give presents. All right, in verse 12, God tells them to come up there and go into heaven, and the enemies see this. They're lifted up. All the while, there's an earthquake killing members of the Antichrist minions. About 7,000 people die. <clears throat> All right, verse 13, the Jews that have not come into faith, God's given them another chance to become believers. This really shows that our God is one that gives us mercy and second chances. They're worshiping God, therefore God has not killed them. Okay. 
Now we start in verse 14. The seventh angel sounds the seven trumpets. This also includes the seven bowls. This is the end of the reign of demons that are free roaming. We learn about this in chapter 16. There's 24 elders worshiping God and giving thanks. However, uh, the nations are angry because they can't do anything. It's out of their hands. Verse 18 is the last part of God's wrath that we deserve in the judging of the dead. There's three major parts to this. The Old Testament saints, the rapture church and the tribulation saints, and the unbelievers are thrown into the lake of fire or hell forever. Verse 19 um, covers the Ark of the Covenant. This was part of the Old Testament tabernacle. And you see in Exodus where uh, God gives Moses the specs of the covenants. Temple of Heaven is opened up and the Ark of the Covenant, which holds the Ten Commandments, is there. Any questions on 11? Okay. Trying to go slower. All right, chapter 12, The Woman and the Dragon. One through six is a woman, uh, figuratively, that is in heaven. However, it's not an actual woman, but it's used to represent the bride of uh, God. She has clothing of the sun and moon under her feet, and her head has. 12, uh, 12 stars on her crown. This will be the significance of the 12 Jewish tribes that we learned previously. And she's pregnant and going through birth pains. Suddenly there's a sign appeared with a red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns. All right, the word uh, didums, which is the actual word for crown um, in Greek, the dragon's tail uh, knocks off the third of the stars down to heaven. And the woman that's giving birth actually uh, kills the dragon that's going to kill her. The dragon is Satan, the fallen angel. He didn't get his way in the beginning and now he's causing havoc. The male child uh, that's being born is Jesus and will rule all the nations of uh of the earth. It's taken up by his place by God. And this is the other three and a half years. God places himself in human form to mature at the end of the tribulation. Where God wins. <laughs> Evil knows the, uh, that they lose in the end of the book. But they're stubborn. They're, they're, they're just going to keep causing that havoc. Even though... God wins, and they're thrown into the lake of fire. All right, verses 7 through 17. <clears throat> Mighty war between the dragon uh, that is on steroids and Michael the archangel. This is a good versus evil fight. And in verse 9, we uh, learn that Satan is thrown down to earth with all his fallen angels. Satan is released for a brief time. Revel I heard something. For a brief time. All right. Revelation 12, verse 10 through 12. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. You accuse them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. 
But woe to you, O earth, and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So your cliff note version of all that is seven, uh, Satan can't get into heaven because he's accusing believers of Christ. He's the one who's going to try and throw you underneath the bus. Anyone ever been thrown underneath the bus? But the bus has got an emergency brake. Jesus. He covers our sins and the accusations with uh, salvation. Or the filter of Jesus. Verse 11 and 12. The devil knows that he's going to lose, but he's going to cause all the trouble that he can. And 13 through 17, the dragon isn't happy. He's going after the woman that represents Israel. Huh? Oh. I was trying to save paper. Yes. Thirteen through seventeen is the woman that represents Israel. She's given two wings of a great eagle. She goes back into the wilderness for three and a half years for nourishment. In verse fifteen, we have a dragon that's breathing water that's trying to drown the woman and sweep her down. A dragon breathing water. All right, the water is swallowed up by earth, and by the wording, it opens its mouth. This could be a euthanism or meaning of an earthquake. The dragon could not get the woman, so he decides that he's going to make war on the offspring, the land of Israel, those that are keeping the commandments of God. The dragon will attack the believers, and it won't be rainbows and unicorns. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard, just like being a Christian is challenging and hard. It's not as easy as most people believe. Okay. I missed one. All right, chapter 13, the characters of the first beast. This is verse 1 through 4. The dragon, there's a beast that comes right out of the sea with ten horns, seven heads, and ten crowns. It's a leopard. It's kind of a, a uh, ability to get it into our mind. It's having slanderous names on its head. All right. John is using this to show the speed and swiftness of the creature. Feel like a bear and a mouth like a dragon. The dragon gave authority to the beast and the dragons to believe uh, Satan. So John's using the same same information we've been previously given. And the (coughs) the first beast is the Antichrist, that the world's worshipping him. Anyone that's ever seen the Left Behind movies, um, the gnarly looking guy. Five through ten, the beast was saying slanderous words towards God, and he's allowed to exercise authority for two years. He made war on the believers and conquered them, and everyone on earth will worship them. But they don't have their name in the book of life. They're not getting a party with Jesus. Satan's acting like a spoiled brat, is the best way to put it, because he knows he loses in the end. But he's still going to cause the havoc. Verses 11 through 18. Um, this is the second beast uh, that is mentioned. It is the minion to the Antichrist. In verse 12, he states that the wounded was the first beast sustained early in chapter 13. The injury is healed and... Everyone's worshiping because of this. All right, there's a mention of the mark of the beast, 666. This mark um, does not, 
this mark that they're talking about, without this mark, you won't be able to buy anything. You won't be able to buy gasoline. So without this mark, you're pretty much stuck. I mean, many poli uh, people believe that this mark could be the use of microchips, but that's just people tr just trying to predict the, uh, the end times. All right, chapter 14. The Lamb and the 144,000. One through five mentions the 144,000 that were marked by God. They're the chosen ones from the 12 Jewish tribes. The sound of heavenly sound of water and thunder. There's a new song that John hears before the elders and the four living creatures that we learned previously. No one except the 144,000 can hear this. They were redeemed and taken home. Bless you. Okay, Revelation 14, verses 4 through 5. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. There has been redeemed from mankind as fistfuls for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lies was found, for they are blameless. Sum this up in 4 and 5. John is mentioning those who have been lustful, that follow the lie, follow Jesus, and aren't lying, are the ones that are being redeemed, following his commandments. All right, the message of the three angels, which is verse 6 through 20. We see in verse 6 a message of an overhead angel who is telling the gospel to every tongue and nation and proclaim that the hour of judgment has come and they're worshiping God. All right, that was 6 and 7. Um, verse 8, we have an angel stating Babylon the Great who made all nations drink some wine of passion. This could be translated as actually drinking wine. 9 through 11, there's a third angel saying that if anyone worships the beast, they will feel the wrath of God, that they will be cast into hell. 12 and 13, John writes for endurance of this. Okay, thank you. I was trying to. Huh? Eight again? Yes. A, um, there's an angel um, um, stating Babylon about it, and they're making them drink the uh, wine of the passion. This could actually be drinking wine, or it could be just a euthanism for the passions and lustful desires of earth that goes against God. Verse 13, well, 12 through 13. John writes for an endurance of the saints or the Christ followers. They'll keep following God and not fall into the trap of the beast. Keep doing what you're doing and don't fall into the trap that uh, the beast has set. 14 through 20 is the harvest of the earth. You have a mention of Jesus or the Son of Man. Mentioned in Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. This is tying it back into previously in the book. And it's coming down with the crown on his head and a sickle that is used to cut crops. 
kind of like that thing where I didn't know what it was until I uh, saw horror movies, but it's got the little blade thing. Huh? I know. <laughs> this is the time for the harvest to be ripe as come. The harvest is earth. There's a mention of another uh, angel with the scythe in uh, verse 17. And there are multiple angels harvesting. The wine press is showing an image of blood from the killing of the enemies of God. The mention of outside the city is referring to Jerusalem, the sister city to the bridegroom, Israel. All right. In verse 20, we have a hint of the location of the great battle. 180 uh, miles or 1,600 furlongs. The rough distance from Armageddon to the north of Palestine. To Edom in the south. Where am I getting the 180 miles? Um, that I actually got from MacArthur's. Revelation uh, um, commentary. It's a calculation of In verse 20. Any other questions on 14? All right. <coughs> Revelation 15. 1 through 6, we start chapter 15 with seven angels and seven plagues. The mention in version, uh, verse 2 of the sea of glass could be an actual crystal platform of some sort. That's describing the God's throne that he's sitting on. The Song of Moses, or the song that was sung after Israel, was freed for the Egyptian army. This is tying it back to Old Testament. Kind of like what they've been drilling into me between Pastor Rich and and Chuck and um, and uh, Trinity is Scripture interpreting Scripture. All right. Um, it's a sea of glass. After that, a crystal platform that, um, oh, you're talking about the Song of Moses? Okay. This is the, um, this is the song that they, they were singing, but they are also singing it when they're freed from uh, the Egyptian. Israel was freed from the Egyptian army. All right, this is sung be because sinners have been delivered um, to Christ away from the wicked world of sin. In verse 4, there's a tabernacle of the testimony being opened. And the seven angels with seven plagues in bright clothes and golden bands on their chest. <clears throat> in 7 through 8, something weird happens. One of the four living creatures gave the angels seven bowls of the wrath of God. The temple was filled with the glory of God. No one could enter the temple till everything was done. Chapter 16, 
beginning of chapter 16 starts with a loud voice coming from the temple. We don't know what this voice is. I mean, I think it's God, but you know, I mean, there's no text actually stating that. I mean, God or an angel. But the voice is telling the angels to pour the seven bowls onto the earth. Verse 2, uh, the first angel pours the bowl on earth, and his harmful and painful sores are on the earth with the mark of the beast mentioned earlier. So if you had the mark of the beast, you, had, you got the sores. Verse uh, 3, the second angel pours the bowl on the sea, and the water is turned into blood. All the fish, the mean marine life, anything that goes into that water dies. I was going to go there, but I was trying to be good. All right. Many believe this is an action uh, where in chapter 8, of Revelation verse 9, this was the prediction. But the timeline doesn't match because the bowls are completed under the sixth trumpet. Verse 4, we had the third angel. He's doing the same thing, but to the rivers and the springs. This is drinking all, uh, destroying all the uh, drinking water. So all the aquifers and, you know, most of us have wells. There goes your drinking water. Hopefully, you, hopefully they have a lot of uh, bottled water. Verse 8, the fourth angel pours their bowl out on the sun. And it starts to scorch people with fire. This is happening to everyone that uh, does not repent and give glory to God. Verse 10. The fifth angel uh, pours the bowl on the throne of the beast. On the throne of the beast. And this is the world going into darkness. People are in anguish. I mean, they're cursing God for their pains and sores. Uh, but God's given them multiple chances to turn up from their wicked ways. Well, it's meaning where where Satan is uh, sitting. Yeah, it's is that's verse ten um, of chapter sixteen. All right, verse 12 through 16. The sixth angel pours her bowl onto the Euphrates River, and the water dries up, prepares the way for the kinds from the east. The angels see the frogs come out of, the angels see the frogs that come out of the frogs of the dragon and the beasts of the false prophets. These pro false prophets were performing signs. They were demo uh, demonic in spirit and preparing for the battle Armageddon. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the way to explain that was there's frogs that are coming out of the beast. I didn't word that the greatest. <laughs> Seventeen through uh, twenty-two, you have the seventh angel that pours the bowl into the air and voice from the temple and says, "It is done." Flashes, rumbles, lights, and thunder. 
not like Cape Coral's uh, rain yesterday. The great city of Jerusalem was split into three and the cities of the nation fell. I'm trying to go slower. All right. Chapter 17, the great prostitute and the beast. Mentioned in 1 through 8, one of the seven angels who has the seventh bowl says to John that uh, she will show the judgment of the great prostitute who seated on many waters. The many waters are meaning many nations. The angel takes John away in verse 3 into the wilderness with a woman on a red scarlet beast with jewels and pearls. Also has the uh, blasphemous names that we were talking previously towards God. Now, this beast that is red is holding a cup full of impurities of the sexual, sexual immoralities. Woman's drinking the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. John, at this point, is marveling towards this woman, but the angel is telling him it's not their time uh, for them to rise up from the pit. 9 through 15, angel is continuing from verse 7 and is calls for a mind of wisdom, which the seven kings and the seven mountains in which the woman is seated. Five of those kings have fallen. One has yet to come, but it does come. It will remain a while. And the beast in verse 11 states that it belongs to the seven and goes for destruction. Verse 12 of this mentions the ten horns that belong to the beasts. There are ten kings who have not received power, but they will have the power for an hour and hand over the authority to the beast. These kings will make war on the lamb, but the called and chosen will beat, beat them. They lose the war. 15 through 18 the angel tells John that there are many people seated where the prostitute was seated in the sea. The ten horns of the, of the beast will hate the prostitute and will kill her and burn her up in verse 16. This woman that you see is the great city of Jerusalem. Chapter 18. I apologize if it's a little flas uh, fast. It's condensed. Just to kind of give you the cliff note version. This is a lot of information that I've tried to compile. Verse 1 through 3. There's an angel that comes down with great authority and says that Babylon the Great has fallen. And has become a place for demons and unclean spirits and birds. All nations that have come into the passion. And the merchants that mentions. I mean we have merchants. Uh, companies the way, the way it appears. That they sell goods have grown rich from the power of their luxury, luxury, luxurious living. <clears throat> One through five. There's a voice telling the people to get out of the uh, sinful and shameful places. For her sins are heaped as high as heaven. There is nothing but sin, and this voice is telling them to not be the way of the world. 
That's, that's something that we're, all, we're constantly told. Follow, follow God, not, not the world. Kind of the binary choice that Pastor Rich has talked about. 6 through 10, the punishment of the living and sin upon them. God has judged them, and this is long overdue. The judgment happens with crying and smoke, and it's a continued theme throughout Revelation, that the sins of men will be punished, and man will not understand their wicked ways till it's too late. Revelation 18, verse 7. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no window, widow, and mourning I shall never see. The reference is the city of Babylon, meaning the way of the world and not the city that appears to be. You can either be in the way of the Lord or you can be in the way of the world. Babylon was a city that was taken over by the Greeks and the Romans and destruction in Isaiah 13, 1. <clears throat> 11 through 15, verse 11 through 15, the vendors, suppliers, merchants, they're crying and upset because they can't sell their goods anymore. They have warehouses of stuff, but they can't sell it. Gold, silvers, and jewels, pearls, purple cloth, wood bonnets, all these things are showing luxury from John. He wouldn't know what a big screen TV was or an MP3 player or a computer was. But he would know the significance of pearls and gold and jewels. That was luxury to him. That was your Mercedes or your Jag to him. Even spice, uh, spices and cattle and slaves are no longer being traded or sold. Verse 14, we learn that these things people long and desire are no more. All gone. The vendors, merchants, who profited off the earth will be afraid of their punishment and they're crying. Sixteen through twenty, the great city is making a mention to Jerusalem the focal point, and the city was covered in jewels and other luxurious things. This is nothing that we see until verse 18. We have ships seeing the city on afar. Here's one of my favorite parts, verse 19 of this. They're throwing dust on their head, and they're weeping and mourning. I didn't actually know what this meant until... Uh, so I asked Pastor Rich, and he's like, okay, check your logos, check this reference. But this is a way for them to show mourning. They tear their cloths, and they're going back to their original sense. Create it from dust. Verse 21 through 24, an angel throws a stone into the sea saying that Jerusalem will no longer have violence and the sound of harps and music will be heard. The next, the light of the lamp will no longer be shine in the voice of the bridegroom, which is Israel, and God will no longer be heard in her. The blood of the prophets and the saints that were killed on earth were found in her. Chapter 19, Rejoicing in Heaven. Verse 1, there's a loud voice in, in heaven uh, saying, Hallelujah. 
This is perfect time for this to happen after the judgments. If we tie what was happening in chapter 18 to the start of 19, they're talking about a celebration of judgment, a voice stating hallelujah. All right, verse 2 through 3. The great prostitute was corrupt, but judgment has happened and the blood of his servants has been avenged. The great prostitute that is mentioned is the city of Jerusalem, which was turning to the ways of the world instead of God. Verse 4, John is, takes Revelation back to heaven where they are, there are 24 elders and the four living creatures that learn are, they're falling on their knees. They're worshiping God who's seated on the great throne. They're saying hallelujah and to God on the throne, saying praise our God. All you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Any questions so far? Six through ten is the start of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And a great voice crying out, saying, Let's rejoice. The bride has become ready, and she has given fine linen. Who is the righteous deeds of the saints, bright and pure. The bride of Christ is Israel, and she's ready. Angel who... Israel. What was Israel then? Oh, the other, the other bride. Remember when we do communion? Mm-hmm. And we do the marriage supper. We do the, the love feast. Yeah. It's representing what? The marriage supper of the Lamb, where we are united with, with Christ. A L A. Mm-hmm. Just like uh, the, the, the Jewish uh, groom would do, he would he would be get betrothed and then go and build a house. And when the house was ready, he would go and get Come it back. to his bride. That's the church. Bride of Christ is the church, not Israel. I apologize, guys. Not a problem. You're doing good. And I'm not going to get through this, guys. So... <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. I'll just do it in after hours. <laughs> 11 through 19, the rider on a white horse. Heaven opens up and there's something with eyes like fire. Many crowns and his name are the only one who knows him. A robe dipped in blood and is called by the word of God. This is Jesus coming back. He come back and commands the armies of heaven with fine linen, white and pure. He's the commander and he's saying, okay, let's take charge. Okay. Revelation nineteen fifteen. From his mouth came a sharp sword in which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them. With a rod of iron, he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. This is a sword coming out of his mouth to symbolize that with one word the battle has ended. He promised us that he was going to return, and he made good on it. After after this word, birds fly over and a voice flies over saying, gather for the great supper of God. So the birds, 
they're eating all the uh, bodies of people who are slain. That went. Huh? Yeah, I, was, I had an image of that for a second. <laughs> All right. 19 through 21, I'm going to stop at 20. Uh, John sees the beasts and their army, and they try and fight Christ with the mighty soldiers, but they get captured with the beast. False prophets and all these that receive the mark of the beast. The false prophets and the beast are cast out into the lake of fire or hell. Everyone dies by the sword that comes out of Christ's mouth and the birds that had lunch on their bodies. It wasn't ac- exactly a happy meal. Any questions, guys? If you want my notes or anything, since this is the last one, I got to get back to my studies. Okay. I can do that. All right. If there's no questions or anything, let's pray and have muffins. Uh, Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to learn more about you and learn about the mercy that you've given us because we all deserve death. Please have us honor and glorify you in the uh, service to come and thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.